Each life lost helps us see the cruelty of the world of sorcery, and from that, we see the great sacrifices made by those who bear the title of Jujutsu Sorcerer. Each Jujutsu Sorcerer who falls means hundreds or thousands of innocent lives protected. These deaths not only push the plot to a climax, but also act as a catalyst for the growth and evolution of Itadori Yuji's power and that of his friends around him. Before examining the deaths that directly affected Yuji and those close to him, let's review some deaths that have more or less influenced the overall situation of the entire world of sorcery. At the top of this list is someone with the ability to open heads, Kenjaku. Kenjaku is behind most of the events that have occurred in the story. From the Shibuya incident to the death of Tengen, to the resurrection of Sukuna, almost everything was caused by Kenjaku. So his departure also greatly affects the situation of the battle, because Sukuna alone is enough to make the entire sorcery world struggle. Although the sorcerer side has used all of its manpower, resources, and techniques, the gap between humans and the King of Curses is too great. If Kenjaku were still alive to add more power to Sukuna, it would likely be a painful defeat for the entire sorcerer side. Kenjaku has killed countless people just to carry out his idealistic plan. Among them, we cannot fail to mention special grade sorcerers like Yuki Tsukumo. Although known for her special grade reputation, the times we've seen Yuki demonstrate her power are relatively few. The time she demonstrated her power the most was also the last time we saw her. Although she, Tengen, and Choso had planned very meticulously, there were some variables in the equation above. Namely, Kenjaku's power was beyond the prediction of all three. At that moment, she decided to stay behind to protect Tengen until the last moment, creating an opportunity for Choso to live. Speaking of Yuki, besides the power that bears the name of special grade, what I appreciate most about her is her macro view of the future of the world of sorcery. The way to eliminate the disparity between those with cursed energy and ordinary people, as well as aiming for a fair world between sorcerers and ordinary people. Similar to Geto and Kenjaku, however, her approach, in my opinion, is the best approach, bringing comprehensive benefits to both. But everything just stops at the approach, because her death left the questions about Yuki's research over 12 years unanswered. However, at least what she did was lay the development foundation for the future of sorcerers. Xenon is one of the three great clans in the sorcerer world. This clan has long been one of the balances of power that helps maintain modern sorcery. Therefore, the departure of clan leader Naobito Zenin is a great imbalance for the sorcerer world in general, and the Zenin clan in particular. Immediately after Naobito's death, an internal struggle began to emerge to see who was truly worthy to be the next successor of the Zenin clan. However, in the end, that question had a completely different answer. Instead of having to discuss who, Maki made the answer much easier. Although the death of clan leader Naobito is relatively influential to the sorcery world, perhaps its meaning is not too great when placed next to Tengen, who is said to have a huge influence on today's sorcerers. The person who plays the role of consolidating the layers of barriers, as well as supporting the crusade to suppress the cursed spirits of sorcerers. Tengen's power, besides the ability to supplement all the barrier curtains, is also the technique of immortality and almost infinite knowledge after she has collected it over thousands of years. Although Tengen's death has great significance, it only creates an imbalance, making it more difficult for sorcerers, but not yet causing the sorcery world to enter a new era. The milestone marking sorcerers falling into difficult times, when all must unite to defeat the strongest, Ryomen Sukuna, begins with Gojo Satoru sending the entire higher-ups to hell. After reviewing the deaths that greatly affected the entire sorcerer system, now let's explore the deaths that directly affected the thoughts, personality, and impacted the power development journey of our main character. In my opinion, the death that most affected Yuji's psychology, as well as righteous actions, is the passing of his grandfather. Just before taking his last breath, his grandfather wished for him to become a good person, responsible, knowing how to help people. From that day on, we see Yuji always living up to his grandfather's words. Although many events happened later, in the end, Yuji's goal is still to do good, to contribute a small part of his strength to protect other fragile small lives. One of the incidents that young Yuji encountered was seeing his newly made friend, Junpei, turned into a cursed spirit right before his eyes. Until now, in the eyes of young Itadori Yuji, cursed spirits were evil creatures, creatures that were obviously purified, nothing to ponder about. 
but when he saw his friend turn into a cursed spirit in front of him and he could do nothing else, for the first time his heart wavered. He didn't know if what he was doing in purifying the cursed spirits was right or wrong. Is there any way to save his friend? So he begged his enemy in vain. But no matter how many more tears he shed, no matter how many times he begged, he couldn't deny the fact that he may have lost Junpei forever. After Junpei's death, although it affected his psychology, there was still not much change in his worldview. He still thought he had to be more responsible, had to protect more people. That was until the Shibuya incident happened, when three shocks hit young Itadori on the same day. That really affected his psychology. First was when Sukuna used domain expansion, killing all creatures in the battle with Maharaga. Although completely unintentional, from that moment his psychology really collapsed. He remembered his grandfather's teachings, he remembered the lives that had just been cut off by Cleave and Dismantle. He was both skeptical of life and disgusted with what he had just done. But it was Megumi who said something that awakened him. You are a sorcerer, not a hero. Your job is to purify cursed spirits, not to ensure everyone's safety. That statement from Megumi doesn't mean that sorcerers will treat human lives like grass, but it means that the priority and necessity of a sorcerer is how to destroy as many cursed spirits as possible. Because when destroying cursed spirits, they have inadvertently helped a lot of people. Applying that statement to real life is the same. Each of us has a unique role and profession. No profession is nobler or more respectable than another, because each job has a certain value. What we need to do is improve our skills so that the value we bring to work gets better every day. Right after Sukuna's domain expansion, Yuji had to witness another heartbreaking scene. Teacher Nanami and friend Nobara, who had stood by him in his early days in sorcery, were killed by Mahito before his eyes. At that moment, he completely no longer wanted to fight. His beliefs, what he thought was right, shattered one by one. He no longer knew what he was fighting for. However, thanks to Todu, he grew up, understanding that in real battles, sacrifice is inevitable. What the living should do when seeing comrades sacrifice is not to be discouraged and give up. Because giving up only makes the situation worse. What those left behind should do is to continue the path, continue the unfinished aspirations of those who have let go. From there, their deaths will truly have meaning. If talking about the most controversial death in Jujutsu Kaisen, we cannot fail to mention the departure of Gojo Satoru. Right from the first chapters, not only Itadori Yuji, but even readers like us could feel the sense of security every time Gojo Satoru appeared. He is both a teacher and a guide for sorcerers of the next generation not to go astray like the current higher-ups. In the first chapters, he was the one who asked the higher-ups to keep Yuji alive. As soon as he learned that the higher-ups had arranged for his students to go on an almost suicidal mission, he decided to deal with all the higher-ups to regain fairness for his students. The day he left, not only was the sorcery world stunned, but even our readers could not accept it. We still hoped for some miracle to happen to revive the beloved teacher. However, in the end, that did not happen. Although this is a great loss for the sorcerer world in general, and Itadori Yuji in particular, in my opinion this is a necessary loss. Because Gojo Satoru's shadow is too big, viewers only focus on teacher Gojo and do not pay much attention to the main character. Itadori Yuji now will not have the opportunity to develop in both power and thinking. Each death that passes is like a step on the journey of psychological development to Yuji's power. The first time he witnessed Junpei's death, he clearly showed an attitude of non-acceptance, disbelief in reality, believing that there would still be some other way. In the Shibuya incident when witnessing three consecutive losses, Yuji is no longer as vague as before. He knows that he has really lost the people he loves. However, at this time, he still chooses to avoid. Instead of feeling useless with Toto's encouragement, he has grown up. Daring to face the truth directly, but it seems he really doesn't accept it. Along with that is anger for Ryomen Sukuna. Then to the recent death of brother Choso, Although still sad, but he still stands strong, trying to analyze the opponent instead of being weak. Through each chapter of the story, we see the sacrifice of loved ones helping him grow stronger day by day. Although carrying within himself an immense source of power from a young age, however, Gojo Satoru did not have an approachable personality as well as power as now from the beginning. His journey is also similar to Yuji's, also going through many events to grow up from those events, 
The first deaths that affected teacher Gojo Satoru were Riko being killed by Toji when about to unite the star plasma vessel in Chapter 72, and the death of Grade 2 sorcerer Haibara. What Gojo Satoru hated at this time was partly because he always considered himself the strongest, but in the end could not complete the mission. However, that's not what Gojo hated the most. What he probably hated the most was the joyful attitude when seeing Amanai's death. The people that he and his comrades had to sacrifice their lives to protect were rejoicing in the death of a fellow human. They were happy because the dead person wasn't them. Who died was not their business, they didn't care, as long as they were alive was what made them happiest. At that time, Gojo Satoru really wanted to kill everyone there because of the cold-blooded indifference of those who considered themselves higher animals. One of the deaths that affected Gojo Satoru's power was Toji's death. Thanks to a worthy opponent like Toji, Gojo Satoru was able to unlock reverse curse technique. From there, optimize the full potential of Limitless as well as the Six Eyes. Knowing that he could not directly defeat Gojo Satoru, Toji had planned very carefully. But there was a variable Toji did not expect, was that in the moment of near death, Gojo Satoru was able to deploy reverse curse technique. In addition, some other deaths that affected Gojo Satoru can be mentioned, such as the death of Principal Yaga, which was the last straw that led him to the decision to destroy the entire higher-ups gang. Speaking of the strongest Gojo Satoru, we cannot ignore the second strongest in the sorcery world Yuta Okatsu. The death that is said to have affected Yuta the most is certainly the death of his childhood friend Rika. When Rika died, he inadvertently cursed the little girl causing Rika to become one of the strongest cursed spirits to ever exist. In addition, we cannot forget his own death when confronting Sukuna. Actually, Yuta is not dead yet, but he was injured too much after eating a move from Sukuna. So Yuta used Kenjaku's technique to exchange bodies with Gojo. As for his own physical body, it did not survive after the fatal attack of the King of Curses. Living in the Zenin clan, where only Megumi is valued for the power he possesses, rather than being appreciated for who he is. Sister Tsumiki seems to be Megumi's only relative. It is because of this weakness that Sukuna used Megumi's own technique to kill Tsumiki, from there completely collapsing his spirit, making it easier for him to control the body. Although Hajime Kashimo does not play a very important role in the story, his appearance has held back the King of Curses for a moment creating conditions for other sorcerers to find opportunities to attack. In addition, his appearance also helps viewers understand the level of power of sorcerers in the past. Unlike other characters who just appeared in the Shibuya arc, Higuruma plays an important role in the battle with Sukuna. The first obvious benefit is that he takes away one of Sukuna's cursed tools, thereby reducing his power. In addition, Higuruma is also one of the few people who received recognition from the King of Curses, Ryomen Sukuna. After we analyze the above characters, we see that death is often associated with loss, with pain. But what if sometimes death is a liberation, a freedom after being constrained for so long? According to ancient concepts in Jujutsu Kaisen, having twins is seen as an ominous point, especially if that pair of twins is born in a powerful clan, because both either have no cursed energy or have very little cursed energy in them. Two innocent children originally did not know they had done anything wrong. But why does everyone scold them, everyone blames them, everyone despises them? Is their birth a wrong thing? It wasn't until later that we knew, Maki and Mai always restrained each other. If one survives, then the other cannot fully exert all their power. Because both are two but actually one, this case, if compared to real life, is also relatively similar to the phenomenon of identical twins. Originally, there was only one embryo, but then the embryo splits into two embryos and develops into two different people. However, contrary to real life when this embryo splitting phenomenon does not affect the fetus too much. In Jujutsu Kaisen, as long as both are alive, no one can fully exert their power. Only when one person dies does the other have the opportunity to be themselves. After the death of her poor little sister, Maki proceeded to massacre the entire Zenin clan. The first person she killed was Ogi Zenin, who had denied her two sisters, seeing her two sisters as the reason he couldn't sit in the position of clan leader. After that, each sword was wielded against all the members of the Zenin clan at that time, with every slash carrying the resentment and oppression that the two sisters had endured for many years. Each blow that fell on people in the clan was like cutting off the chains, the prejudices about the lives of her two sisters. Now she is completely free, 
she gets to be herself. In the world of Jujutsu Kaisen, the sacrifices of those who came before are valuable lessons, shaping the living ideals for the next generation. Each death is a legacy, a torch lighting the way for those left behind. What about you, fans of Jujutsu Kaisen? What are your feelings about the sacrifices in this anime? Share your thoughts in the comments section. Each of your contributions is extremely valuable to Ackerman Recap. Now, if you find it interesting, remember to leave one like and one share to support us. Thank you for watching the video. See you in the next videos. See ya.